to some people around you real quick. If you're online, maybe you can uh, say hi to everyone online here for a moment <clears throat> as we get settled in here. It's awesome to have everyone here and online joining us. If you would do us a favor, if you're home at online, you have an opportunity to share this feed. Just heard a story before I came on stage that a neighbor of one of our pastors was watching our service a few weeks ago. And because of, our, because of the sharing that we're doing, people are catching the messages and it was encouraging to this family. So I just want to encourage you to keep sharing because it really does help. Um, and I want to encourage you too every week to make a point to invite people, uh, neighbors, friends, whoever, to join in. Because I think right now today's message would really speak to a lot of people because it's on prayer. And I believe prayer is essential. And I hear everyone prays. You know, it's kind of interesting how people pray uh, about things. And they may not even have faith in God, and yet they talk about prayer. Now, the thing about Christianity is we know who we're praying to. We know he's a real God, a true God. And as we just talked about, he is a faithful God. <clears throat> One of the most important spiritual disciplines in Christianity is actually prayer. It's also one of the most powerful weapons that we have in the Christian faith is prayer. And I think we overlook it a little too much, more than we should, and we don't see how vital it is. And, um, you know, I'm praying that through this message we see how important prayer is to the Christian walk. Um, and this past four months, which I can't believe are approaching four months, I think has really increased our need for prayer. Whether we grew in our prayer life or not, I just want you to know this. Starting from this day forward, I pray that you see how essential prayer is. Whether you grew in your prayer life the past four months, maybe you stayed the same, maybe it got, it got worse. I'm not here to condemn or judge or anything like that. Just here to challenge you to make prayer essential moving forward from this day forward in <clears throat> your life. And I know prayer is essential to God because Jesus lived a life of prayer. I'm going to get into that for a second. But Oswald Chambers said a really powerful quote. And by the way, we had a fantastic conversation on our Facebook private group page of our church. So if you're on Facebook, you haven't joined our Calvary Church online group, I would recommend you do that. We had a really good conversation, a lot of transparency, a lot of honesty about how we struggle with prayer in our walk because I don't think anyone doesn't struggle with that at times. And so, um, but here's what Oswald Chambers said. He said, we tend to use prayer as a last resort, but God wants, to use, wants, wants it to be our first line of defense. We tend to use prayer as a last resort, but God wants it to be our first line of defense. He goes on to say this, we pray when there's nothing else we can do, but God wants us to pray before we do anything at all. Most of us would prefer, however, to spend our time, this is what he says, spend our time doing something that would get immediate results. Oh, my goodness, that is so me. I'm the immediate result guy. We don't want to wait for God to resolve matters in his good time because his idea of good time is seldom in sync with ours. Like, for instance, Joseph had a dream. Twelve years later, it comes true. <clears throat> you know what I mean, that kind of time. We don't like that. But thank God for that person that prayed for the other person and years later they give their life to Jesus because they didn't quit praying. You know what I'm saying? Anyone have a family member or friends who came to Jesus years after prayer? I've even heard of stories where fathers on their deathbed give their life to Christ and it took an entire year to pray for I mean, sorry, did I say year? Entire lifetime. <clears throat> Martin Luther says this, to be a Christian without prayer is no more, or no more possible than to be alive without breathing. In other words, prayer is like oxygen and breathing to Christians. And the thing about prayer is it is a spiritual discipline that takes intentionality. You actually have to focus on your prayer life. But I think that's good because that means you're focusing <clears throat> on God. Now, Jesus, we know he, was a, he, was, he, he lived a life of prayer. Jesus was connected to his father all the time. We know that daily he got away to pray. It was a custom for him to do that. 
We know that he spent 40 days in the wilderness praying before he started his ministry, same time where the, the devil was tempting him. And he fasted 40 days too, which is wild. We know that he spent all night praying before he chose his 12 disciples. So he, you know, and before important tasks, he prayed for long periods of time. We also know that before he went to the cross, he was in the garden praying before that. A lot of things you could be doing, but he decided to pray to have strength from his father. But Jesus also taught the Lord's Prayer. And we titled it the Lord's Prayer. It wasn't titled that. Jesus gave uh, a way to pray, and we titled it as we interpreted the scripture and put it into print. But Luke has a brief version of it. I'm going to use the Matthew version today. And I think what's really interesting is, is this prayer was actually said or spoken by Jesus because he came from praying and the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Can you teach us how to pray? I think that's a great question, by the way. That's a really good question. By the way, a pastor friend of mine told me, he said, did you notice that Jesus never taught his disciples how to preach, but he did teach them how to pray? Now, did he teach them how to preach? He did. He modeled it. He showed them how to do it. But he took time not only to model prayer, but to teach how to pray. That's how important prayer is. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to that. Matthew, I'm sorry, Matthew 6. My apologies. Verse 7. <clears throat> Matthew 6, verse 7. This is what it says. When you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. <clears throat> they think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Pray like this. By the way, notice that he already knows what we need, but he still, asks, he still says we should pray. Why would that be? Why would Jesus say, he already knows that you, what you need, but you should pray anyway? It's a really good question that people have. I think it's really simple. That God wants us to be in line with his will. God wants us to seek what he seeks. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. And I also think that God just wants to fellowship with you. That prayer is a way to fellowship. But this, this prayer is deeper. Uh, I just heard someone tell me today, Francis Chan did eight-week series on just this prayer. An hour-long per sermon. Um, so I can't do justice to this prayer because it is rich. But today I want to give you, what is this prayer bringing up in our prayer lives? Because this is what it says. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. And forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. But rescue us from the evil one. He starts off with our Father in heaven, our Father. Prayer is supposed to be relational. Prayer is a way to enjoy fellowship with God. It's not a chore to check off a list. That's the first takeaway for you there. Prayer is relational. It, it really is a way to enjoy fellowshipping with God, and you don't want to make it this chore, like, let me check it off. I prayed today because he's our Father. So he's saying, Come to me, go to God with a relationship. And I love that. And then he says, our Father in heaven, hallowed, or may your name be kept holy. So while God is a, a heavenly father, or while he's a father, he's also heavenly, he's also great, he's also holy. We should come to him with reverence. We should come to him acknowledging his greatness, but also acknowledging he's our father. I love that. It's a nice balance. So he's your father here for you, but he is holy, and we should be holy. And when we come to him, we should consider his holiness and consider are we holy in this moment. And he gets into how later on how we need to check our own personal walk. And he says, our father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. 
May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I love how Jesus teaches us to pray with the kingdom of God in mind. Prayer transports your minds and your heart from this world to God and his kingdom. So when you pray, you get a little break from the chaos in this world. And you put your heart on God. And you remember that there is a kingdom that we don't see that is invisible, but it's there. To put our minds on the kingdom of heaven. Now, one thing I love about this is, is that praying our Father in heaven, for me personally, keeps us unsatisfied, keeps me unsatisfied with the condition of our world and busy, keeps me busy ushering in what is to come. Let me explain that for a second. Praying heaven on earth keeps us unsatisfied with the condition of our world and busy ushering in what is to come. It's really simple. You ready? When you put your mind on what God's kingdom is supposed to be here on earth, you really go, man, we have a lot of work to do. Did you hear what I said? Like to think about God's kingdom, to think about heaven, to think about God's love, God's goodness, God's peace, God's joy. Couldn't our earth use that right now? When I think about heaven on earth, I'm not satisfied with what I'm seeing right now in our world. And it makes me go, I need to do something about it. So let me get to the next part. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, guess what? When we pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're actually praying for our own responsibility to bring heaven on earth. Let me tell you why. Because you are part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus dwells in you. You are temples of God. And so you and I are king, the kingdom of heaven on earth. Jesus was heaven on earth. Amen. Well, Jesus commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus commanded us to be ambassadors and representatives of the kingdom of heaven, but here on earth. In other words, we're supposed to demonstrate what heaven is supposed to be like. So when your neighbor offends you, but you forgive them, you've shown them heaven. Instead of revenge, you're showing them the kingdom of God. Revenge would be earthly wisdom, but forgiveness would be godly wisdom that comes from only above, as James teaches. So we're demonstrating the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And so when I pray, may heaven be on earth, may your will be done, I actually have to assume some responsibility to make that happen. Now, I actually have a takeaway for that so I don't mess up our, our tech team, but it, it says this. Praying God's will means we are willing to be the instruments through which God accomplishes his will on earth. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Guess what? Jesus tasked us to make his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So every time I pray this prayer, I'm reminding myself that I'm part of God's mission and he thinks I'm pretty important to his mission. So now I'm not only thinking about our father who loves me, but I'm also thinking about how holy he is, and i got to reevaluate my holiness. And then I'm thinking about how he is in heaven, but he wants heaven to be here on earth, which is the end times when we have the new heavens and the new earth that come together. Because Jesus is bringing that back. Okay? And we're going to be part of that journey together. So I'm going to be a part of it in the future, so I need to start now. Amen? See, this prayer is deeper than just going through the rote like remote, like just, let me just go ahead and say it wherever I go, the routine, not remote, I said remote, the rote and the routine of praying this prayer, that's not what it's about. He's actually getting them to focus on his will on earth and how we're a part of it. Prayer is vital to ushering in the kingdom of God. I want to read you this story that my pastor friend sent me. He said, five young college students were spending a Sunday in London so they went to hear the famed C.H. or Charles Spurgeon preach. If you know about Charles Spurgeon, powerful preacher, really big into prayer. You'll see why in a second. While waiting for the doors to open, the students were greeted by a man who asked, 
gentlemen, let me show you around. Would you like to see the heating plant of this church? Like the boiler room, you know? Who wants to see that? They were not particularly interested, for it was a hot day in July. But they didn't want to offend the stranger, so they consented. The young men were taken down a stairway. A door was quietly opened, and their guide whispered, you ready for this? This is our heating plant. Surprised, the students saw 700 people bowed in prayer seeking a blessing on the service that was soon to begin in the auditorium above. By the way, that man was actually Charles Spurgeon leading them down to the basement to pray. You see, the work that God has for the church is prayer too. It's essential. Prayer is essential. Before Sunday happens, we should be praying for God to move through the live feed in this room, in our hearts, in the friends we bring to church, in the friends we send the links to. We should be plowing those fields for the kingdom of God to come down on earth spiritually, praying that the spirit of God would work in powerful ways. Because, look, I, I'm not that creative. I'm not that great. I can't do this without the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not that great at evangelism all the time. Some people are not gifted with evangelism, but the Holy Spirit makes up for our lack of anything. Amen? And so here they are. He's an amazing preacher. Now we know why. Because 700 people are down in the basement praying before he preaches. Now we know why the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit makes up for what we don't have, church. Like, here's the thing. You may struggle. I, I, the Holy Spirit is trying to speak right now. This is not in my notes. You may struggle to know what to say to your neighbors, your friends, your family members about Jesus. And he's saying, just pray and trust me and I will give you the words to say. In fact, I will work on their heart so they shock you and surprise you and ask you questions. But you got to pray for that first. You got to want your neighbor to be saved. You got to want for your family to be saved. You got to believe that they can be and let me work. I'll prepare them. All you got to do is do what? The Bible says throw out the seed. Cast the seed, which is the message of Jesus Christ. And we do that in two ways through our word, but also our love. And we do it with the power of the Holy Spirit. Praying God's will means we are willing to be instruments through which God accomplishes his will on earth. It says this. He says, give us today the food we need. I'm going to be quick on this one because we know this. We can depend on a lot of things on this earth, but there's things that the earth can't give us, the world can't give us, that God wants to give us. Like supernatural energy and strength and peace. But physical needs too. Matthew 6 says that. Here's what's really interesting. Is Jesus says, don't worry about clothing and food. Seek first the kingdom of God. I don't know what is more essential to me than food. Especially today after service for Father's Day. That is essential. A steak is a essential to me. And Jesus is like, don't worry about any of those things. Seek first the kingdom of God, which isn't fake. It's real. It's actually real life the way life was supposed to be. And God's going to blow you away how he pulls out resources and, and finances and all these things if you seek to do his will first. It's amazing. Wow. Our dependence on God instead of this world. Our faith in God instead of this world. The next part he gets into is so cool. He says, forgive us our sins. He, he's saying, pray about your sin. Who wants to do that? Jesus wants us to. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. So prayer keeps us humble about sin in our own lives or else we become numb and blind to it. In Hebrews 3, verse 12 through 14, the writer, we think is Paul, says that sin leads to deceitfulness, which leads to those losing their faith in God. Sin is dangerous. But prayer keeps us humble about our sins. Jesus is saying, pray for forgiveness for your sin. 
ask God to forgive you for your sin. In other words, stay aware of sin in your life. And I love how Jesus has us focus on our sin first instead of other people's sin. I did say that. Humble slice. God has us focus on our sin first before we start pointing fingers at everyone else's sin, doesn't he? And then he doesn't say point out people's sin, even though there's a time in the Bible, there's times where the church has a right to judge, by the way. We've misinterpreted that scripture. We make judgment calls all the time. I know I do when it comes to defensive driving, whether that person is about to pull in front of me or not. We make judgment calls all the time. But in the church body, we are allowed to call a brother or sister out for things that are going on in their life. Because it's love. It's not shaming. It's love. It's because we care about them not being deceived and losing their place in the kingdom of God. But listen, for, yes, it is real love. Amen, sister. Yes. But listen here. We, this is what prayer does. This is your next takeaway. Prayer keeps us unoffendable. I'm making that word up. The Lord's prayer encourages the practice of forgiveness. In other words, it keeps you from getting so easily offended. Because he says, look at your own sin and then forgive the other people who are sinning against you. Just go ahead and do that. Go ahead and do that because you're not perfect. As you can see, you just went through your list of sins. Right? Remember the Pharisees wanted to stone the prostitute. He said, he who has no sin, be the first to cast the first stone. They couldn't. They dropped the stones. Because when you evaluate your own life, you're, you realize, wow, God forgave me, therefore I should forgive others. And he actually says that next in Matthew 6. That if we do not forgive others, God will not forgive us. That is a scary place to be. Prayer keeps us unoffendable. Because the Lord's Prayer encourages us to practice forgiveness. I read a quote from Charles Spurgeon about prayer a few years ago that wrecked me. I'm going to read it to you. It's, it's a dangerous quote. Earnest prayer will be sure to bring love with it. I do not believe you can hate a man for whom you habitually pray for. If you dislike any Christian, pray for him doubly, not only for his sake, but for your own that you may be cured of prejudice and saved from all unkind feeling. Wow. In other words, you have an enemy, pray so that your attitude towards that enemy changes. Because they may never change. But at least your attitude and offense can go away. And that's the reality. That is the reality. They may never forgive you and they may never receive your forgiveness. Right? They may never come to you to apologize, but if you pray for that person you and you forgive them in here and you go to God and say, God, I forgive them, that offense is gone in Jesus' name. It's covered under the blood of Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Like I have, I think I probably have some enemies that have no idea I've forgiven them because they don't want to talk to me. And that's fine, but I've already forgiven them. It's all good. And I probably, same boat, I, I probably don't even know it. And I'm ready to talk and I'm ready to fix it. That's just the way it's going to be. But at least in here, you could be okay. And then lastly, he says, and don't lead us or don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Wow. You know what that is? What I'm reading there, what I'm, what I'm praying there is humble wisdom about my weaknesses. That I could be, I could yield to temptation. So I'm praying that God, I would have the strength not to give in to temptation. Jesus says, and the, the word of God says that he won't let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. But just the idea that we understand that we are vulnerable to sin. And that even in our own self, we can give in to sin. Okay, James teaches that. That when our own evil desires tempt us to sin, not just the devil. So Jesus is saying, stay humble about your weakness and know that I am there to rescue you from the evil one. I love that. What a powerful prayer. And I really just scratched the surface. 
we hear in this, in this prayer a focus on God out of this world. Thank you, God, that we can get a break out of this world and think about the kingdom of God. We, we see that he's our personal loving father. We see that he wants heaven on earth, so we got some tasks to do and some praying to do. We see that he has our daily supplies taken care of. He's going to take care of you. I mean, I'm, doing a, I'm going to do an entire sermon on how much God has blessed our family financially in the past four months. From trusting his, we just been given out and God just keeps pouring in. It's amazing. I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a message on that. You need to hear God's miracles like this. It's powerful. And then God's saying in prayer to, to seek forgiveness of sin in your life, to forgive other people, and then to look out for temptation because it's going to be there. What a powerful prayer. We could pray this every day if we think of it that way. We should. If we struggle, if you struggle with prayer, I want to encourage you to practice praying and thinking about these areas. But let me give you two reasons, just two, because there's really thousands probably, but two, maybe hundreds, let's go with hundreds. But just two why we may not be praying. Number one, we may lack faith that God hears us. And I really like what Luke says in Luke 11, 5 through 13, but we've lost some time here. But basically, this is what I'll say in, the, uh, verse, in verse 11. You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? In other words, God loves you. He's going to take care of your needs. And he hears you. He hears you. But again, Charles Spurgeon said something amazing. He says, if you believe in prayer at all, expect God to hear you. If you do not expect, you will not have. God will not hear you unless you believe he will hear you. But if you believe he will, he will be as good as your faith. Again, you are praying to a God who hears you, he loves you, and he is a faithful God. But sometimes... He has you pray until your prayer actually lines up with his will. Sometimes unanswered prayer means that they're not unanswered. It's not that he doesn't hear you. It's just he might want a different kind of prayer coming out of your heart. Or what about this? If we get the prayer answer right away, do we come back to him or do we wait till two months until we need him again? Like what if he delays answering prayers because he's liking our fellowship with him? He likes the fact that we keep coming back to knock on the door and go, God, Hey there, I'm, I'm back again. Hey, it's good to be with you, my son, my daughter. Before you get into all your requests, my son or daughter, can we hang out? Can I just love you? What if God wants to do that with you in your prayer life? Hey, I know that I, know that I am almighty and I can provide all your needs, but you know what? I also just want to fellowship with you, my son or daughter, because I love you. And there's things that you're asking for that you don't necessarily need right now, you need this instead, so let me give it to you, like the Holy Spirit, who, by the way, is peace, faithfulness, goodness, love, joy, and all those amazing things, all the blessings we, des- we have been promised to have. I was in Dominican Republic for a mission trip a few years ago, and I was amazed at the faith of these workers at this orphanage we were at. They just seemed to, like, see miracles all the time. And we were talking about their building and how they got it built. And, uh, you know, they're in the middle of the slums of Dominican Republic. And they have an amazing operation going on with orphans. And she said something to me that blew me away. She said, and this is completely almost against what I've just been preaching. But she, she said this. We don't pray for miracles. We expect miracles. Like, yes. Like, don't get it wrong. She wasn't trying to say we don't pray. It's just that she says God just shows up. So now we just expect him to show up when we have the need. In other words, he knows every need before we ask. But then when they do ask, they know it's coming. Wow. They know it's coming. And let me tell you, they, I was there when they got blessed by a local organization to help them pay for everything they needed. 
out of nowhere, out of left field. And I was like, how'd that happen? She's like, we just expect it to happen now because God is good. Wow, what kind of faith is that? That's amazing faith. And lastly, a simple practical reason why we may not, we, we may struggle to pray, and there are many, is we are insecure about how we should pray. I just want to encourage you to keep it simple, to talk with God, talk to God for others because other people need our intercession, our prayer for them, and then talk to God about your request. I love what Max Lucado said. He said, our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble, but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. See, the power of the prayer is in who is hearing it, who is our Heavenly Father. So do not criticize yourself or overcomplicate it. Be who God has made you to be. Simply have a loving conversation with your Heavenly Father and then begin to talk to him about others or for, or for your own forgiveness, for the kingdom of heaven on earth, your needs, and even temptation. So here I'm going to give you some tips. We're going to close how to jumpstart your prayer life. I think we need to have some action steps here to help you. Um, know that God loves his children. Just leave here knowing that God loves you and that he wants to listen to you. He does listen to you, and he loves to give to his children. Don't overcomplicate prayer, like I said. Pray daily at a set time and, and, and pray at all times on the go if you need to. But can I give you a, a heads up? Because we had a really good discussion on Facebook about this. But um, praying on the go works. But here's the hard part. When you're on the go and your mind switches to getting into the grocery store, God may have had a moment where he was ready to give you a scripture and you didn't receive it. So there's value in both, and I really want to encourage you, if your weak area is to set a time to be with God, then crucify that flesh, make room for God, and hang out with him. In other words, what am I saying about crucify flesh? Our flesh doesn't want to pray, it wants to play. Prayer is a spiritual discipline. We have to discipline ourselves to get alone and seek the Father. And so I want to encourage you to do both. Do both. Pray on the go, but also find a time, even today before you go to bed, find a time to go to God because there's plenty of things to pray for right now. Amen? Speaking of that, use prayer journals or lists. Write down your prayers so you don't get lost. For me, it helps me stay focused and I get to look back and look at all the prayers that were answered by faith. Get a prayer partner. Call someone up. Hey, can we pray together for the next 15 minutes? Absolutely. Let me tell you something. I love praying in groups or with people more than by myself. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I love hearing people pray. I don't care how bad it is. It probably isn't bad, right? To God, he just loves hearing it. I love it. I love being with people to pray. It, it fires me up. And then go for prayer walks and drives. And what I mean by drive is, is go drive, but for no errands, no nothing except to be with God. If you need to get alone, maybe the house is too full, then go for a walk and talk to God. I'll leave you with this quote. Corey Ten Boom once said, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Man, I don't like that quote. <laughs> I don't like that one. I pray that our church would make prayer essential prayer as our guide, our steering wheel. Amen. Before I pray, I just want to let you know, um, we really appreciate your giving. And just so you know, we've had giving stations in the back today on your way out if you want to give. By the way, you can give during worship as we're singing as an act of worship if you'd like to do that. Because I know some of us like to give as an act of worship. You can do that on your phones. You can do that with envelopes. And there's giving boxes right here in the corners. Do not be afraid to do that during worship. Um, as you exit, just please practice um, safe distancing as you go. We're not going to do row by row. We're just going to ask you to just spread out as you leave and just be mindful of that. And then, dads, wow, enjoy this day. Happy Father's Day, dads. Happy Father's Day, dads. 
And now let's pray to our Heavenly Dad. Lord, we thank you so much for today. We thank you, God, for your word. And Lord, just to be real right now, God, we're sorry for neglecting such a powerful part of our faith. Help us to be more faithful in prayer. God, may we long to be in your presence just to be with you. And God, may we come to you more than anything else for our needs. And may we go to you for the people in our world, our family, our neighbors, our community. Thank you, God, for being a faithful God who listens and hears everything we have to say and to give to you. We love you, Lord. May you bless dads today and families in their quality time. And we remember you as our good, good father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. Thank you all for joining online. We love you. We'll see you next week.